Hi. Uh, welcome here. My name is Andrei, Andrei Babitsky. I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm the author and uh, the host of the podcast Snova Nikogada, which is roughly means never come again, uh, dedicated to, uh, to, to the enormous circumstances we are uh, in now. Uh, Masha, uh, uh, Masha is a journalist, or a journalist. It is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a couple of times uh, I've heard uh, different people uh, introducing Masha, and all of them uh, had the same problem, because at some point they have to say how many books Masha have written, and nobody knows for sure. And, and, uh, but it's north of a dozen. Uh, I think it's 11, actually, at the last count. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure either. I've actually had this argument with my publisher. But anyway, it's, it's, it's in that neighborhood. And uh, the number apparently goes down uh, sometimes. And if, you, if I haven't written a book in a couple of years, yeah, it's like, it decreases. Yes, like in a video game. Right. And uh, uh, also, uh, least but, uh, last but not least, Masha writes for uh, the New Yorker magazine uh, and uh, teaches at New York CUNY University Journalism School. And frankly, I think she they need no introduction. <laughs> and, and, and I have a, a problem with pronouns, uh, but, but I'm uh, working on it. We're going to talk about what can be done or should be done when nothing is to be done, what, what is to be done when nothing should be done or could be done, which, which is a question uh, that we, me at least as a Russian emigre, I hear it all the time from two different sources. Uh, first, my inner voice asks me, repeats this question all the time. What, what Andriusha, you could do today to, to stop it, to change it, to reclaim your homeland? And uh, not surprisingly, I hear it all the time from people from other, more lucky or less lucky nations, uh, uh, who uh, understandably ask me, uh, what, what the fuck are you going to do with everything that's happening? And uh, so uh, this double, doubly important question is what we're going to discuss. And uh, uh, here I will give you uh, the mic and, and, and uh, uh, give the draft of what we're talking and then we'll get back to it. Um, okay. So, um, well, first of all, Andre, thank you for doing this. Um, <clears throat> I, I asked Andre to be in conversation with me because I know him to be someone I can ask to read a ridiculous amount of stuff and just kind of say, you know, read in this direction, read in that direction. He's going to come up with interesting interpretations that are actually going to help me with the book that I'm working on, which is uh, the, 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 the topic of this talk. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the book project and then maybe we can, uh, we, we can have a conversation. So <clears throat> when uh, the full scale, scale invasion began, I was about a third of the way through writing a book that I thought I had totally reported, uh, so as in collected all the material for. Um, and the book was, uh, the, the title of the book is The Certainty of the Reality of the Possibility, um, which, is, uh, which is a quote from Eric Fromm, the social psychologist, and it's, it comes from his writing on um, the nature of political hope. Right? So, um, and the, the theoretical model that I was work using in the book was the model of the parallel polis. And the parallel polis is a concept that, um, and maybe we can go a little bit deeper into it later, but basically it's a concept that comes from writing um, by Czech 
dissidents in the 1970s um, that also emerged from a conversation between Czech and Polish dissidents. Um, and the question they were asking in the wake of, uh, of the crushing of Prague Spring was, what is to be done when there's nothing to be done? Uh, when being in confrontation with the regime is futile and possibly lethal, what can you do? <clears throat> and what they emerged with was this idea of basically building a working model of the future and the present, where instead of being in confrontation with the regime, you build a parallel polis, right, a parallel society, which I think is an important point. It's not, it's not a, a group of your best friends that, that <clears throat> hello. Uh, it's not a group of your best friends. It's not a group of people who are homogenous, right? But it's a polis. It's, it's something that requires work across difference. Um, <clears throat> and, and it functions according to different rules than the dominant society. And then, in the best case scenario, when the regime collapses under its own weight, you have a working model of the future. Now, the reason I started talking by saying that this was what I was um, writing when the full-scale invasion began was that when Russia invaded Ukraine, that even though there was very little Russia in the book, in fact, at that point, there was no Russia in the book, uh, but it's still through the sort of the model into question <clears throat> because if you are creating a parallel polis in not a self-contained totalitarian regime, but in, a, in an expansive regime that's going to wage a genocidal war, then what are the moral and ethical implications of doing that? Basically, if you're making life more livable in a society like that, then are you in some way contributing to sustaining it? At, at that point, uh I would interrupt to, uh, to ask you and probably to give the audience the idea of, uh, of when this question is actually asked, when uh, the level of desperation comes to, uh, uh, comes to uh, realization that nothing can be done and now you have to think from this point, uh, which existed in, in Czech Republic. Uh, in the Czech Republic after um, the Prague Spring was crushed, obviously. It existed in Soviet Russia, too. Uh, uh, I, I read uh, one, one of, uh, one of uh, the Soviet dissidents and refuseniks uh, was told that, you know, it, it, it can go for ages. Byzantine Empire was uh, rotting for 300 years before it ended. And he replied, 300 years sued me. And uh, uh, that's the level of desperation. And uh, sometimes uh, people just, uh, uh, you know, people from outside don't get it. It's, it's, it's the starting point when you, uh, for, for me, obviously, for many people who left Russia, which was uh, a way to uh, admit that we failed once. Uh, you don't, uh, you know, emigrate before you, you admit that, this. And uh, at this point, um, uh, if you don't leave Russia, or even if you do, you have pretty much a, a, a limited uh, range of options. Uh, among them, notoriously, popular are to drink yourself to, to cirrhosis or, or, or do nothing or, or sit on your couch. And uh, uh, as, as, uh, as a human beings, we need something, we need uh, an emotion, a stimulus, a, an incentive to do something. We cannot just do nothing. And whenever you naively ask yourself what could be done, you quickly reach the answer, which is not actionable information, which is uh, demotivating, which is uh, uh, lazy, which is uninteresting. Uh, and uh, so uh, for, that's my emotional part of our conversation. For me, it's very important. For my grandmother 50 years ago in Moscow, it was as important as it is for me, because nothing suggested then, as nothing suggests now, that it's going to end soon. Uh, so uh, 
And at, at this point, imagine that we're not in Tbilisi, that we're in Moscow, for example. <laughs> uh, 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 we can, you know, un unload our spring and, 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 and uh, start talking about what can be done. And what, what parallel polis is a parallel civic society, right? How you do it and, and why? And I hope I explained why you know the experience of Soviet dis of East Eastern European dissidents is so relevant for us. But what what are actionable uh, you know bullet points that we can take of of Václav Benda's idea? Right. So well, uh, let me backtrack a little bit <clears throat> because I actually I want to arrive at a place where I say there, I don't know that they're actionable bullet points, right? Or they're bullet points, but they're not actionable, right? Because, because I think that um, the, you know, the intervention that, that I had to stage in my own project after February of last year um, was actually something that I should have staged earlier, which was to, you know, I, I kind of knew that it was going to be a book about the lack of universal recipes. But, but I was still writing it as though it weren't a book about the absence of universal recipes. Um, but it is. So, but you know, going back to, uh, I want to, I want to pause on 1968 for a minute uh, and, and pick up on things you were saying because I think that one way that we, you know, sort of in the in the in the in the imaginary imagination, uh, we think of. 1968 as this incredible year of protest around the world that um, that changed life for people in the West, and and actually plunged uh, Soviet satellites into despair. And I think that a different reading of it is possible. Uh, in fact, the mass student protests in you know in West Berlin and Chicago and New York and in Paris um, create uh, changed culture in a way that was very easily assimilated into the structure of existing society and arguably didn't change society. Changed language, changed you know, some, some logical constructions, but didn't change society in fundamental ways. But in the Soviet sphere of influence <clears throat> actually launched this a incredible conversation between Czech and Polish dissidents, um, arguably launched the dissident movement in Russia um, you know, there, there were li uh, national liberation movements in other parts of the Soviet Empire, but in Russia, the dissident movement was launched um, with that demonstration that um, that your grandparents participated in, in protesting the Russian, the Soviet invasion of um, of Czechoslovakia, and the parallel Polish model arguably uh, worked best in Poland. It actually, you know, they actually created a parallel pose, and it actually was the working model of the future that took power when the, uh, when the totalitarian regime collapsed. Right. So, <clears throat> so the consequences of this um, of those protests and the conversation that they produced, that conversation about what is to be done when there is nothing to be done, are actually quite staggering. Right. It's not a quaint ide idea from a five-page essay by Václav Benda. Um, but Benda's, uh, I, I, I don't know that Benda was actually at that point arguing for a parallel civil society, right? He was arguing for a parallel society, but the, the examples that he chose to use in, in his essay were really interesting, right? One was the underground cultural life that existed in, um, in Czechoslovakia, and he was arguing, you know, people are already able to organize civil, uh, you know, parallel society. Look at underground theater, underground publishing, underground circulation of ideas that we already have. You know that could be formalized and and intentionally built. Um, and also, he said, look at the shadow economy, uh, which is not civil society in any traditional uh, understanding, but it's a form of self-organization and it's also a form of people uh, building bonds of cooperation and trust where the state fails. Right. And that's that's a hugely important example of, of the parallel poles. Uh, and at, at, uh, Václav Benda was the uh, Czech uh, was a Czech dissident who coined the term parallel polis. He was quoted and inspired Václav Havel among others. 
And at this point, it's, I think it's important to uh, answer an unposed question. <laughs> Why do we think that Eastern European dissidents were successful? Because uh, for many, many years they were just, you know, saying good things and writing books and, you know, and, and uh, 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 building some grassroots small-time organizations. And at some point, like, the whole continent collapsed and uh, 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 from, from an outside, for, for an outsider, uh, uh, these could be unrelated events, actually. For many people in Russia, they seem like unrelated events. And uh, one of the things that I, I should notice um, uh, that are, seem to be uh, relevant and important is that at some point, they were very successful in that after the collapse, uh, uh, both Poland and Czechia uh, took a different road than, than Russia, for example. And uh, nowadays it seems uh, like obvious, but uh, 30 years ago it was far from obvious. And, and the idea that certain kind of people took power and that certain kind of people determine the future of their countries and that certain ideas were considered uh, uh, intolerable or, or indecent at, at, within these societies. So, uh, 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 because we're talking from a different time point and uh, uh, at this point of time there are people in Russia who, yeah, or beyond Russia who are vocally against the war and who are uh, saying things and uh, you can one can add, say that they are just saying they're just uh, uh, they're doing nothing it's just talk and no uh, action but uh, in fact it's much more important than it seems to be because nobody wants just this war to end everybody wants this end this war to be unrepeatable in the future. And before we move on completely from the 1960s and 70s, <laughs> I'm just going to tell you my favorite story about people talking, right? which is which is the <clears throat> the conversation that I referred to earlier between Czech and Polish dissidents. So you know they were they were in written dialogue, uh, but by the 1970s they were um, all under some form of travel restriction, they didn't have passports. So the thing that they wanted to do most, uh, which was to, to speak in person, appeared to be impossible. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, the, the, uh, Hannah Arendt has this very strong argument that it is impossible to think in conditions of tyranny. And the reason it's impossible to think of in conditions of tyranny is because it's impossible to think alone. And so the, I think there were highly aware of this and uh, and which you know which is why this conversation was so important so finally they figured out that in a mountain range between Czechoslovakia and Poland there was a spot to which both groups of people could get legally and it happened to be along a hiking route called the path of people's friendship so you know and these were not hikers these were readers and smokers but um, uh, but, but they they got there, um, and they got there actually twice. And both times they wrote these very flowery declarations um, that uh, that basically amounted to saying, you know, we're here, we're together, we're we're talking, and we want democracy. Um, and and then you know eventually they got caught, and the people who were originally gathering at this spot, uh, who included Václav Havel and Adam Michnik they could no longer get there, but they actually kept using the path of people's friendship to smuggle literature in and out of both countries, which made it um, impossible for the Czechoslovak police to track down where, Czechos uh, uh, where dissident literature in Czech was being printed because it was unbeknownst to them being printed in Poland and vice versa. So, um, so then fast forward to 1989, 
and the Polish communist regime collapses seemingly overnight, right? It, um, it asks the leaders of the Polish parallel polis, which, which is the Solidarność movement, uh, it asks them to sit down with them and basically negotiate a transfer of power. And by the end of the summer of 1989, Adam Michnik is a member of parliament and editor of a, of, of a legal newspaper. And so he marches over that same path of people's friendship. And instead of stopping at the meeting point, goes down the mountain on the Czech side of the, of, uh, of, of, of the border <clears throat> and goes to visit Havel, uh, who has just been released from prison. And tells him what's happening in Poland and Havel says, well, yeah, you know, but things are diff different in Czechoslovakia. Nothing like this could happen in Czechoslovakia. And Mifnik says, mark my word, you're going to be president before the end of the year. <laughs> and Havel looks at him like you have lost your mind. But he was president before the end of the year. Yes, if I, in, in, the, in the late 90s and early, uh, later 80s and early 90s, uh, um, an American uh, economist of Turkish descent, Timur Koran, uh, started studying the fall of the post-Soviet regimes and uh, uh, he wrote a book about that, about the immediate, immediate and un un unpredictable nature of this fall. And it starts with an observation that uh, uh, 10 uh, months before the uh, um, fall of the Polish government, Ten weeks before the fall of Berlin Wall and ten days before the fall of Ceausescu, nobody in, 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 in the, within the country could predict it, and uh, uh, which is important because it's uh, it's one of the sources for optimism, and it's very important uh, to be optimistic in such circumstances and talking about such things. Um, although. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is where um, the certainty of the reality of the possibility becomes an important concept because <clears throat> so Eric Fromm has this uh, wonderful writing on, on hope and he really parses out hope and optimism and hope and faith and I don't think he'd be a, a fan of saying that's why we need to be optimistic right? um, because optimism I think for him lies very close to blind faith which is basically sitting back and saying, well, I believe that this regime is not forever and it's going to collapse eventually. Um, or, I mean, that's, that's, that's empirically true, but I believe that you know, things will get better <clears throat> and I'm gonna sit around waiting for it. Um, he talks about the sort of the feedback loop between action and hope and where hope sort of becomes a moral obligation, it's, it's that it requires you to create conditions that allow for hope, right? So that's where I think it in intersects with the concept of the parallel polis, because by building a parallel po polis, you create the certainty of the, of the reality, of the possibility, which gives you hope. And he also has this beautiful phrase that hope is the mood that accompanies faith, right? but it's not faith. And, by the way, uh, uh, because everything everybody is hoping for is a revolution, obviously. Uh, revolutions come from different sources, and there are violent revolutions, there are uh, um, coups, as we're watching right now, failed coups and stuff like that, and there are revolutions of dignity, and we've seen quite a few of them uh, in India, uh, in, in, in the mid 20th century, in Eastern Europe a lot, in Ukraine a few years ago, uh, like actually in Ukraine twice in 20 years. And uh, 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 there is a reason to, to hope that revolution of dignity, revolution of uh, public disobedience, revolution of uh, dissident uh, uh, 
uh, feelings and, and, and thoughts uh, is not only uh, a better way to, to achieve the goal, but probably the most effective way to achieve the goal. <laughs> Among the things you, 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 you um, uh, uh, research, there is this thought too, right? Um, well, see, like I said, I'm not going to, to give any universal, <clears throat> any universal recipes. Um, and I'm not, is, is this? Huh. Okay. Um, see, <laughs> I had hope, uh, and I took action. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea what the action was, though, uh, which is kind of my answer, right? Um, I, you know, I'm not going to make an argument uh, that something is more effective uh, at bringing down um, a totalitarian regime than something else, right? Um, I could make the argument something is a better way of bringing down a totalitarian regime, right? And it's a better way uh, in itself, even if it doesn't bring down a totalitarian regime. And I think that's, that's a very important sort of part of the idea, is that, um, <clears throat> and something that it actually took me a few years to, try, uh, to, to figure out about this, this, this book project, that a lot of our standard sort of matrix of measuring the um, significance of something don't apply, right? We immediately say, okay, well, is it going to be effective? Is it going to be, um, is it going to be scalable? Is it going to be reproducible? Uh, and I think, you know, basically, and is it going to be sustainable? And I think basically all of these are wrong, right? I think, I think the only sort of correct question is, is it going to be generative? You're talking obviously not, not only about uh, uh, resistance, but also about the economy, about intangible things, or, and, or things that are thought to be tangible, but they're not. Um, yes, I mean, um, <clears throat> I'm looking at, 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 at a lot of projects, and one, one thing that was really challenging was, uh, so I mean, the, 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 the sort of the basic argument that I was going to make was that, uh, look, they're, uh, they're parallel police projects, um, and they're great parallel police projects, not un just under conditions of totalitarianism, but anywhere where the um, mechanisms of democracy fail or mechanisms of state fail. And, and, let's, and let's look at them. And so then I went to Detroit, which is where American democracy goes to die, and I was, um, I was, I was um, observing this sort of urban farm, um, urban uh, rebuilding, community building, everything building project that was really just interesting and, and inspiring. And, and after just sort of hanging out with them for a while, I asked the <clears throat> one of the people who had created it, to sit down with me and tell me sort of the nuts and bolts and sort of the, and I was going to, in the traditional journalistic way, write down all his arguments, his conceptual framing of the thing that he had built. And he sat down and he started telling me about selling jam and how, uh, so how like they harvested berries at this urban farm and then they made jam out of them and then like they had to comply with all these regulations to be able to sell it. And it was not only incredibly boring and insignificant, but it was like some sad capitalist tale about selling jam, which was clearly not the purpose of the whole thing. Uh, and, <clears throat> and then I went to see uh, somebody who's become very, a very important interlocutor for me in this project, uh, a humanistic uh, geographer named Catherine Gibson, who, slight digression, uh, has been writing under, uh, was writing for decades with her co-author, uh, Julie Graham. And they were writing as J.K. Gibson Graham. Um, and then Julie Graham died about 10 years ago and Catherine Gibson continued to write under the pseudonym J.K. Gibson Graham. Uh, and then she also writes as herself. And recently there was an anthology that came out that included a piece by Catherine Gibson and a piece by J.K. Gibson Graham, 
who are sort of entitled because they're clearly you know two separate thinkers. Uh, there's a kind of intellect that exists um, in, in 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 the noosphere that's uh, that include that still includes uh, Julie Graham. So Catherine Gibson said, <clears throat> "Oh, but you know." Um, that's what's going to happen if you if you are going to write about projects like this because we don't have language to describe them and the people who are creating them also often don't have language to describe them right so if all the language that you have is the language of you know wage labor uh, and then that's what you're going to try to apply to something that it doesn't apply to and that's why this conversation was breaking down so you are go basically going to have to step in and describe what you see um, but <clears throat> But also, what she was telling me in, in a, you know, over the course of many conversations, and this is something that she has developed, is this theory of weak theory. Uh, and um, which is that sort of we have strong theories, strong narratives about what is happening and what, what exists. Uh, and if we subscribe to these strong theories, it makes us incapable of seeing the other stuff that exists. And so weak theory sort of raises up things that don't conform to strong theory. I've, I have no recollection of where I started with this, but, um, <laughs> but it felt like a necessary response. Uh, for me, it's very nice to, to hear all the things you're saying because I'm an anarchist and you're giving a, 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 an anarchist sermon. You're pretty much saying that uh, government is is evil. I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not saying that government is evil. Certain governments are. Uh, certain governments are evil. That uh, parallel systems of uh, uh, production of dignity of communications are in place to be built. That more than that, we cannot actually. Our official language is incapable of describing what's happening and, and gives us uh, the worst idea ever of what's happening on the ground. Uh, a good example is uh, Russian opinion polls or, or, or another good example would be uh, uh, how uh, Ukraine of 25th of February uh, differed in public perception from Ukraine of 23rd February. Like before uh, the invasion began, pretty much everybody in all the countries in the world were sure that that it's a paper house, a house of paper, that it will gonna collapse in in a few days, that uh, uh, like Kiev would be captured, and and then a week passed and another week passed, and uh, we saw that. Actually, Ukraine is a totally different country, a country that nobody described in advance. No, uh, no I don't know, no ambassador in the world, no uh, Kissinger in the world, no, nobody, nobody, not in Kremlin, not in Pentagon. And uh, I think it's very important because, it, you know, it works for us, isn't it? Yes, um, but I, okay. So important correction. I don't. I'm not saying that government is is, <clears throat> is evil, right? I think that government, in a lot of places, the way it is currently constituted, uh, ranges from you know not great to truly evil. But but you know, I think I think the idea of, of governance is actually a perfectly valid idea, uh, and and I really like from the beginning. I I, I wanted to make sure that this project wouldn't be interpreted as a tirade against government. So one of the, <clears throat> uh, one of, uh, the, the book ends with a project that I think is a parallel polis, um, which is actually a government project. And it's, um, it's the system of public transportation in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, and uh, and, it, and it's, it's a really incredible, thing on so many levels. So um, in the early 1990s, Medellin was a mess of a city. It, was, uh, it, it had grown exponentially because of the violence in Colombia. And so a lot of people who fled violence in rural areas 
came to Medellin and settled spontaneously. So there was a community that settled sort of on the town dump, which is in, uh, right in the middle of the city. And then there were a lot of people who built hovels in the hills, right? And Medellin is, it's, it's a long, long valley. And, uh, and the economy of, this, of the city is in the valley. But people live in the hills, and there are sort of rich hills, and then there are poor hills, and, um, and nothing was connected. And so rich people could drive from their hills to, to, to the city, and poor people just lived in the hills and couldn't get down to the valley. Um, and Medellin, uh, so the, the Medellin had a visionary mayor um, who came up with the idea of building a public transportation system that would explicitly and intentionally be a system of connecting communities. So they designed it uh, and sort of repairing the social fabric of the city. Um, and so they designed it, uh, every design decision that they made and every organizational decision that they made um, had that, um, took, an, took that intention in, in, into account. So for example, they built the line that goes in the, uh, through the valley they built it above ground so that people would see that they're passing through the city rather than putting in a tunnel, which would have made sort of engineering sense. They built these skyways to bring people from the hills into the valley, um, which are, you know, which also create this, this sort of soaring view of the city, but they're also kind of, they're, they're literally elevating, right? Um, they're kind of explicitly aspirational. And they also, everywhere they put pylons, they put community centers and playgrounds. But my favorite part, uh, I have two favorite parts, so I'll, 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 I'll start with the lesser and then finish with, the, with my absolute favorite part. So, so one thing that I love about them is that, and this is still going, they, <clears throat> they have college students driving the trains. And it's an economically totally inefficient system. Um, basically, scholarship students, as long as they're physically fit, can apply uh, to, uh, to go through training. So they're trained for six months. And then for the next two and a half years of university, they work several hours a, a week driving trains. It would, so it's absurd, right? Um, they teach them for six months. And then they put in, I don't know, 16 hours a week of driving these trains uh, for two and a half years. And then they leave. Right? The idea of this is that they're creating a professional class of engineers and doctors and lawyers and whoever they're going to be who used to drive the trains. Right? So it's, it's the, like this web of investment in, the, in, this, in this public transportation system, social, uh, social investment. And my absolute favorite thing about this is that a couple of years after they started building the, the metro, they ran out of money. <clears throat> and they halted the building. <laughs> and for like four years, they ran workshops that they called metro culture workshops, uh, where they like went into communities and taught workshops on what it was going to be like when they actually built the public transportation system. Uh, and, um, you know, which, and this, I think, uh, this is an aspect of the parallel polis that I haven't addressed yet, but it's, there's this huge element of willing something into being, right? Imagining it into being. It, it again, it's that certainty of the reality of the possibility. And they were doing this just by going through communities, so eventually, uh, sort of separately from that, they were raising money and eventually they raised enough private money to go back and, and build the system. Uh, but there was also, uh, there was a mythology in place for the public transportation system by the time it was built. Which is exactly what Russian opposition does. <laughs> because it's lacking resources to, <laughs> to, to, to launch a change. They are talking about that and, and it's a good point that it's actually working in a sense. And, uh, let me tell a, a short personal story because I, I, uh, I've been living in Tbilisi for, for, for the last year and uh, uh, I went, uh, probably many of you uh, visited it, there was a, 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 an exhibition called uh, uh, Before Bucha, there was uh, Abkhazia, tea, Ab Abkhazia mm -hmm. uh, about what happened in Abkhazia and there was a 
woman there, a very old woman, uh, uh, who told about all atrocities she um, encountered, and it was visibly painful for her to talk about them. And in the end, she sa said something like, uh, and now it's happening in Ukraine, and when it happened with us, nobody watched, nobody saw it, and that's why it happened. And now, despite I don't like it, I, I am coming out and, and talking about that, because that way it could change. And uh, it was obviously very sad, but uh, a sliver of hope there was that, in fact, she's incredibly right that uh, uh, the international and uh, 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 support for Ukraine and, and how quickly it, it was built and uh, how efficiently it was built and how black and white the picture was perceived in, in, in everywhere in the world from the first day. It is not only due to the you know, effective public relations of Ukrainian government, it's obviously uh, uh, a result of uh, of the conversations that took place before. We started our conversation from, uh, with dissidents and there were many Ukrainian dissidents and it so happens to be that because Ukrainian culture was so um, uh, intentionally killed and, 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 and repressed. That most of Ukrainian dissidents were uh, fighters for national culture. Uh, uh, and uh, they were either fighters for Crimea, because they were Tatars, or they were, uh, I don't know, philologists who, who just wanted to publish their repressed um, colleagues. And uh, it happened 40 years ago, so many, most of them died. Uh, uh, some of them died in prison, like Vasil Stus. But uh, uh, the amount of uh, reflection they produced obviously built the resistance now. Because nowadays, uh, uh, Ukrainian, I don't know, resistance to, to invasion stands on the shoulders of the people who not only were dissidents, but they had a, a very particular problem to solve, which is existential threat to, to their own culture. So just talk, and that's, by the way, it's a, an, I'm sorry. No, 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 no it's okay. I, I yes, it's, um, uh, yes, because, because there, is a, there is a meta question when a talk is titled what can be done when nothing can be done, so the, un, uh, uh, the implicit question of everyone in the audience is, is this talk the answer itself? <laughs> is sitting with the mics and talking loudly uh, to, uh, to people is, is something that could be done and would change anything? Well, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> My, my hunch is that it's, if there's some disagreement, then it's more likely to, to change something than if, you know, if, we're, if we're in a room of, of, of people who agree on everything. Um, so I think there's a little bit of disagreement between us, but maybe not enough. Um, but, but I don't know. I, I, I want to, to, to take us back to, to the title of the talk. And one other thing I, I keep thinking about is that actually uh, it's a big part of what people think about and talk about in Russia, is that what, whatever they do, they seem to be inefficient, not willing enough to fight the system, uh, or, or just, you know, uh, 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 doing uh, wrong things, or I don't know. Uh, one can always say uh, that uh, Alexei Navalny does nothing because 
okay, he sits in his prison and you know he cannot uh, raise uh, uh, um, uh, um, an uprising or something. And uh, and the question that bothers me is when is the right time to judge? Uh, was it was it effective or not? Because for one, I I am happy to be in the world where Alexei Navalny exists and says the things he says now, as opposed to the world, a, a hypothetical world, where he wouldn't exist and and nobody would stand for the you know uh, for um, uh, uh, um, for, for, for for justice. Um, well, see again. I think it's the wrong question. Like you don't. I don't think we're asked. Uh, the question should be: Is is it effective? Right? Is it generative? Is it leading to other things happening? Um, and I think you know. There, the answer is yes. And 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 the advantage of asking a question like that is actually that you can ask it all the time. Like, um, and you know, I'll I'll, I'll use an example of uh, of what I think is both an extraordinary parallel polis project and also one that is sort of in constant question uh, 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 process of of self self questioning and self judgment <clears throat> in russia right it's um is the volunteer movement of helping people who are leaving ukraine going east right so it's um it's people who are you know there's there's really just a staggering uh, network of people who, you know, who do things from helping evacuate people from the occupied territories to helping people who were quote unquote evacuated by the Russian forces to remote places in Russia, helping them get out and get to Western Europe or back into Ukraine by going west or helping people <clears throat> whose Children were taken to recreational camps in Russia, you know, get their children back, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it's, um, you know, the, uh, the number of people being helped in this way is in the millions. Right? Uh, and and I, th I mean, with all the sort of difficulty of measuring these things, it seems that there have been some five million border crossings into Russia from Ukraine. And, so, and uh, certainly, many and probably most of those people have received volunteer help at some point or another. <clears throat> so that's, um, and, and, and I know having interviewed a lot of people who are involved in this, that there's a range of views in this volunteer network, right? So it's a bona fide parallel polis. It's actually, uh, there's a huge amount of, of, of work across political and social difference. Um, and at the same time, many people who started doing this work because they wanted to do something to help stop the war, or as one person I talked to put it, uh, she views it as paying reparations. Right? Um, they, um, they also realized that uh, many, possibly most of the people who end up in Russia, um, you know, not those who are transiting through Russia, but who end up in Russia, decide to stay. Some of them decide to stay because they actually believe in staying, uh, you know, the, in, in, in the regime. And, um, and so some of the work that these volunteers are doing is helping in some way or another support the regime and the propaganda that the regime produces using these so-called refugees. Um, and you know it's difficult to find the terminology because these are people running from war, um, but they're deportees. They're not refugees, but they might self-identify as, as refugees, right? Um, and there's there's a less, uh, a more complicated, less sort of horrifying idea, which is that even when volunteers are helping people who ended up in Russia uh, through coercion or you know through lack of choice. Um, to get out of Russia, they're also kind of doing the government's work. Um, but they're doing the government a favor by basically liberating it of, its, of potentially troublesome residents, right? So how do they 
square their intention with their actions. And what I'm trying to say is that the fact that they are questioning this and sort of reasoning their way through it and, um, uh, and making intentional decisions about whether they're going to continue this work is itself generative. Uh, so, if we uh, try, as I wanted from the very beginning, to do a list of bullet points, <laughs> very straightforward. I am not much of a thinker, I like bullet points. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what if the question is what can be done but nothing can be done? The first bullet point is that it there's, it's going to be something, it, it has to be something generative. It has to uh, produce and, and enlarge the area of action and uh, inspire other people and bring them in. And the second bullet point I, 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 I read from you, I, I, I'm taking from you, is that to, uh, to be a parallel police, to be a uh, a building block for future better uh, uh, system of government or, or coexistence. It should it should go across uh, across familial or ideological lines. Um, it should there should be difference, right? Otherwise, it's not a polis. So whatever you do to fight the regime. Uh, uh, you have to believe in, in it to such an extent that you're willing to uh, collaborate with, with uh, unpleasant people. Well, I don't know if I would go that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, certainly in the examples that I've used, um, I mean, especially the, 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 the last example, yes, there's a, like a lot of cooperation with unpleasant people. No, I think it. By the way, I think it's it's uh, a, a nice and aphoristic uh, thing to to learn that that uh, you have to hate Putin more than you hate your neighbors to, to build something good. I like that. Uh, it's yeah, and 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 um, uh, the third thing, which is obviously because we seem to share this. Um, admiration for dissident movements is that uh, insisting upon simple truths and uh, and uh, refusing to take part in in, uh, in deception and and uh, insistence to to call a shovel a shovel or how you say it in English in proper English to 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 say to say the war a war which is actually a crime in Russia nowadays is uh, is very important and much more important than it seems to be for a person who uh, who, who doesn't recognize it as a troublesome dilemma. Yeah, I mean, you know, back to the the, the essays from the from the seventies. You know, there was Havel's uh, in the power of the powerless. Uh, one of his strongest points was that uh, the regime survives on. The, the the passive cooperation, uh, passive acceptance uh, of, of of the lie, right? Of living within the lie, and so his recipe was to choose to live within the truth. The obviously the again the last example that I used shows how that's not exactly a universal recipe either. It's a, it's an aspiration, right? But at what point, for example, do these volunteers who are helping somebody who's proclaiming their love for Putin stay in Russia, at what, you know, if they don't confront this person, which they don't, right, and they shouldn't, um, how, you know, where's that line between living within the lie and, and living within truth? Um, and that line is blurrier than maybe we, th we thought in the 1970s. Um, that's not a bad thing to know. And the fourth, by the way, bullet point I, I came by is that uh, uh, many, mm, uh, much of generative work that's been done at, the time, at this very time uh, uh, goes be, be below the radar. We cannot see it. 
and as, as it happened before in the history of humanity, we will probably learn a lot about writers of the, uh, of the lands, uh, writers of the, how do you say it, I'm sorry, writers of the people. But, 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 but only if somebody records that in the present, right? Um, I mean, it's, uh, unfortunately, right now, there, there is some of that work happening. There's, um, there's testimony, testimony being recorded and sort of, you know, the facts of even this very secretive movement are also being recorded. But it is very important because when you open a newspaper, uh, the evils are, uh, 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 are uh, extensively written about. And, 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 and I think it's a good thing personally that at least the evils are properly described nowadays. But, uh, 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 but the psychological effect of this is that uh, uh, people tend to think that there are more bad th people and fewer good people than it is the, the case in, in reality, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I think, I think, I think that difference may not be huge, uh, just numerically speaking, but I think, I think it's more the thing that we were talking about before, that the, the weak theory points, right? That if, you're, if your theory is that um, society is monolithic, then you just are incapable of knowing that something like, the par like a parallel polis exists. Should, should we go to questions? Yeah, very soon, yes. Yes, but I just uh, want to repeat your last thought. Uh, you said that if you think the society is monolithic, you w won't notice what's really happening there. And uh, I would put it on uh, 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 carved in stone on every Slavistic cathedra there is in the world. <laughs> because, you know, Russia seems monolithic, and that just seems that we cannot see whatever good is happening there. Uh, I guess that uh, I'm talking too much and I have a way to mend it. Uh, because from now on, I would suggest that all, uh, the audience ask questions and then you can talk to Masha. Or Andre. <laughs> I, um, I think we're from the same generation and um, I had a long discussion with a friend of mine who's Russian, Russian exile, um, and she's 50, 55. And um, she said, look, I went to uh, a lot of hope in the 90s. I really thought we were building something and I gave everything. I was a journalist, I was a playwright. I gave everything I had and I really believed. Even when Putin was there, I believed that I hold on, you know. And then the, uh, the invasion happened in Ukraine. Uh, even after 2014, she thought maybe we could do something. But then after, uh, in 2022, she just left. She left and she's telling me, I have no hope. I'm disgusted. I don't want to hear anything about Russia. I just want to do my thing. I'll do my art. Uh, I'll work for my magazine abroad. But that's it. And um, so... Your generation went through, a f you know, there, it's not like a Havel or, or these guys, they, they you know, the, the whole thing collapsed and then they were able to act. You, first you had one hope and then it didn't work out and now you're in exile. Is it difficult to keep alive the hope of your compatriots abroad, uh, of your generation? Uh, one question. And you're talking about the dissident uh, of Eastern Europe in the 60s, 70s. Um, is the, uh, the, the, the whole question of exile, of Russian exile right now, is it closer to the exile, the Russian exile, of, uh, of the revolution, of the Bolshevik revolution, where uh, you had a bunch of people who left, and finally it's, 
is their children who went back to Russia. In Georgia, you have the president of Georgia. She's, she's the daughter of uh, some exile during the, rev the revolution in Georgia, you know, during the 20s in, in Georgia. So is the, the comparison better with the, uh, the exile of uh, Russia of the, the 20s or 1917? Um, well, actually, I don't think it's a great comparison because I think that um, the huge difference between <clears throat> be, uh, between people who left Russia in 2022 and the people who left 100 years earlier is that the people who left in 2022 had the experience of the people who left 100 years earlier to look at and and to learn from it. And I think that, I mean, this is anecdotally, but I think that one of the biggest lessons that they learned from it was that don't hold out hope that you're going to go back in a few years because the Bolshevik regime is going to collapse. Um, I think, you know, and um, I, you know, and Andrei may be different in this, but I'm not making an argument for believing in a wonderful Russia of the future. Um, and that's really not what, uh, what the whole sort of, uh, the, this idea of political hope is about, uh, because that is that is an exercise in faith, right? And I'm not kind of interested in exercising faith. I'm interested in uh, the idea that you build something in the present, and you measure it by the criteria of the present. And if you haven't, uh, you know, if, if the regime doesn't collapse, you at least have had the political experience of living in an actual you know, situation of cooperation and doing good in the world. Um, and that's all that any of us can ask for. As much as I could not to speak about Georgian matters, but uh, on the way here, while turning from Leonidze to Machabele Street, there was a graffiti there, Free Niko Gvarame. And looking at that, I thought probably a president who comes from the old immigration is not so bad a thing. Sometimes it comes handy. And then probably, you know, um, uh, the very fact changes things. But uh, uh, um, uh, Russia survived like, like five, six immeasurable number of immigration waves. And, and uh, uh, before the uh, First World War, like 300 people immigrated yearly, mostly Jewish, uh, um, to America. Russia is a country, is a, is a, is a source of immigration, a like huge source of immigration. We have all kinds of experiences of immigration. Uh, 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 and all kinds of lessons you can learn. But what is important, just numerically important about Russia, is that it still, you know, has 140 million people or something, and and uh, and uh, a lot of waves of immigration to support. Yes, a lot of waves of immigration, but a lot of hope to to build because it's just in human nature, you know. But like people tend like like like. Um, uh, 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 like grass, they tend to to grow through cracks in in in, in the uh, stones, and whenever they feel the stone is cracking, they start growing up. Uh, and and numerically, it's a huge country, so it, it has enough uh, people determined politically, uh, economically, or or else, uh, uh, motivated to build their business there. Uh, to, to get power, to, to build an NGO, uh, it's never a problem. Like, uh, I think that whatever happens in Russia is almost not affected by, by the whole of immigration from Russia. We are more visible, but on these scales, it's, we have to get to, to find some humility to admit it. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, yeah. Thank you for the discussion, and I found it really interesting. I forget how it was phrased earlier. This point about how maybe the task might be different when it's a more self-contained authoritarian society versus a more um, expansive or belligerent one. And there was a lot spoken about the Polish or the Czechoslovakian dissidents, and 
I don't know, over the past year, I've thought about what lessons might be learned from parallel polices or communities, civil or otherwise, in countries like Germany or um, Yugoslavia and Serbia. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about these and if there are um, maybe lessons or examples that can be taken from those contexts. So is there, is there something that we can also learn from Germany and Serbia and the communities that were there as more belligerent countries at a certain point in time? Well, um, <clears throat> there's actually one of the great, great, great examples uh, of, um, of a parallel polis is the Kosovo parallel education system that, <clears throat> that existed within the confines of Serbia. I don't know if, uh, you know, um, if that answers your question, but in, uh, I guess, 1992, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, Serbia basically, um, uh, Serbian authorities basically banned education in the Albanian language in Kosovo. And the entire Kosovo education system went underground, right? From kindergarten to through university, um, creating this incredible web of, um, of, of classrooms all over the city, uh, you know, studying behind uh, darkening curtains, um, you know, taking circuitous routes to classes to uh, avoid police, um, and this, you know, this system basically survived through um, through the liberation of Kosovo um, in in the late 1990s, right? So, <clears throat> so that's uh, you know that that that's that's an example of a parallel polis. I haven't, other than that, I haven't looked at projects in, in Serbia or, or Germany. Um, you know, I think it's actually reasonable to, answer, to ask the same questions about, you know, uh, they're, they're easier to answer in a way, right? But, um, but you know, was uh, the, the Kosovo parallel education system also a way of making life more livable in occupied Kosovo? Or Kosovo, that you know, that had that had become a place under occupation uh, without you know, without any mili uh, real military intervention, um, and you know, and what were the consequences of that? And we can you know at this point look at it um, <clears throat> because it's been long enough. Well, can I add one thing about Eastern Germany? Because I personally think it's uh, there were inspiring things in Eastern Germany, for example, people fleeing over the wall and stuff, and, uh, or, or Berlin airlift or something. But I think what's important for me about Eastern Germany uh, is that, uh, is the Stasi, because uh, actually Stasi is, is uh, the di as I see it, is the direct line between the Nazis and Putin. It's like two generation line, like, uh, like Nazis told Stasi and Stasi Putin, and uh, and and uh, and I think it's instructive just to understand, like the uh, uh, the extent of depravity of these people. You have to understand it. That, and and uh, whenever I read anything about Stasi, that's what I think. Yes, I yes, that's where where, where it comes from. I, 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 that somehow springs into my mind when I hear about Eastern Germany. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, discussion. Uh, actually, the uh, idea of uh, Second Pole quite resonated with, uh, with me because I was uh, researching and uh, writing quite a bit on the history of activist uh, struggles in Europe and uh, correlation of that uh, str uh, str struggles to the evolution of uh, contemporary political theory. And that idea of second pole resembles a lot the ideas of uh, Italian uh, uh, philosophers in the 1970s who were actually writing on the ideas of uh, exodus, exile. And these ideas were quite heavily criticized by the uh, leftist parties and now the leftist political theory in general. In terms of that, this uh, idea of cr creating alter alternative pole, this idea of kind of it implies a bit the, the living of the actual classical political space and creating something 
quite di uh, quite different and not uh, engaging in uh, for in for example conflicts uh, in uh, maybe even violent action and uh, this uh, ideas of italian uh, oper um, operate f philosophers they were quite tragic because after their their work in the uh, 70s I'm, so, I'm sorry can you ask a question yeah 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 it's just two uh, minutes yeah uh, the 1980s came and uh, neoliberal regime took over and do you think that that uh, idea of uh, second poll this uh, creating something uh, di different political uh, utopia uh, is it uh, uh, deemed to failure because uh, uh, to, cre to create something you need to leave uh, political space? Uh. No, that's a, that's a great question. And um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, that the reason that you know, we started and mostly focused on totalitarian societies is that there is no collective political space to leave. There is no collective political space, right? And um, the parallel polis is an exercise in creating political space in a society in which one doesn't exist. Now, my argument is that um, <clears throat> their sort of spots of disappearance of space for collective discussion, collective action, cooperation, even in societies that we think of as functionally democratic, right? Which is why sort of having established, like in the structure of the book, having established the concept of the parallel polis in a totalitarian society, I then go to Detroit uh, and then go to other societies where, um, you know, where the fabric has failed, right? But it's, uh, you don't turn away from, from a functioning collective space. You turn away from, uh, you, or you try to create something in a space of failure. Hello, thank you for your talk. My main question is, uh, I don't like to speak for a younger generation, but I will, uh, nevertheless. Uh, we live in a constant state of apocalypse now, as you may know, and Lots of us are staying there in Russia. We risk imprisonment, we risk death. We build this collective space, collective political space. But do you think it's morally correct for us as immigrants to call for action for them? Um, I don't know that it's, it's not even a question of whether it's morally correct. Like what's the point of calling for other people to act? <laughs> like that never works, especially if you're elsewhere. Uh, I think that, you know, do something. Right? Uh, that's it. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying, it, 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 it's, this seems to me a misleading question. Right? There's, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, you can express anger at people for not acting, you can express disappointment. But ultimately, it has zero consequences, right? It's not, you know, uh, it has no real life consequences, it has no moral consequences, because nothing happens because you, you call for other people to act if you're not acting yourself, and if you call for people elsewhere to act if you're in a different place. So. And um, I have a short, short question for you, and is it a thing? Are there, is there a sizable part or some noticeable important immigrant persons who, you know, who do this, who, who, uh, uh, who uh, ask young people to act, who, who say raise arms, I don't know, take telegraph, yes? Oh, then, no, I, I, I just, I'm sorry, just uh, uh, there is a thing, a uh, difference between uh, organizing something from outside and and you know and 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 saying and and giving moral judgments so uh, if, uh, obviously obviously uh, uh, moral judgments are worse because they they add insult to injury yeah quick question here um, I wanted to talk just a little bit or ask just a little bit about sort of the tension between building a polis that actually includes people of diverse views diverse backgrounds which I think is really really important um, and also, right, especially in a place like Russia, right, in order to actually be involved in this, you have to believe firmly enough in what you're doing to take real personal risks for it, right? And there is this tension between 
sort of that ideological purity and that drive and the need for compromise. And I wonder if this is sort of exacerbated by social media bubbles in the United States who talk about cancel culture, all of these things, just sort of in the modern life. Yeah, well, you know, the interesting thing is that the example that I used about Russia actually somehow, uh, and, you know, at this point, this, this system has existed for a year and a half, right? It basically came into existence right after the war started, right? Um, uh, after the full-scale invasion started. <clears throat> and it genuinely brings together people uh, from, uh, you know, with really diverse views, uh, including people with pro, pro war views, right, uh, who are key to extracting people from actual war zone, right? Um, and how people manage to build relationships, you know, they may be transactional, they may be limited, but they're still sort of relationships of trust um, across these huge ideological divides, divides, I don't know, right? In a, in, in a country that where you would think it would be terribly risky. I mean, one possible answer is that the government is actually quite happy that they're doing this work for now, right? But, um, but they still understand that that may change very quickly and <clears throat> putting a lot of people at risk. So, um, but, but, but you know, there's a different question I think sort of contained within your question, which is how does a community, a parallel polis, negotiate uh, the, the, who is in and who is out, right? Um, and you know, you can, you can sort of intuit that it has to, uh, that in most situations it's based on some shared set of values or shared set of goals. But there's a really interesting um, <clears throat> case of um, one of the longest existing parallel poses in the world is a place called Freetown Christiania, uh, which is a, um, a community, you know, a collective community smack in the middle of Copenhagen um, that is self-ruled, um, ruled by, it's actually self-ruled as a number of different communities, uh, each of which is ruled by consensus. And among other things, they accept people into communities uh, by consensus. And that's been, uh, it worked for a while and, um, and it's no longer working. Um, and the people who are sort of trying to bring Christiania into the present are making uh, two very interesting arguments. One of which is that uh, unless Christiania sort of breaks this logjam of, uh, of not wanting anybody who is not a hippie from 1968 to, to join, then it's going to turn into a museum. Um, it has an age problem, right, among other things. But, um, but also, the, and, and this is the argument that I find most intriguing, is that Christiania actually, in its 55 years of existence, or close to 55, um, has been incredibly influential in Danish society to the point where Danish society has in some ways surpassed Christiania. And so by sort of not evolving, by, by preserving itself, uh, it has turned into a conservative, um, sort of past-oriented uh, uh, political entity. And this is something that I forgot, but I think it's super important to the definition of the parallel polis. Put it on your bullet points. So this is like where five or something? Number five. Number five. Future oriented. Um, so, you know, past oriented movements are basically uh, the opposite of what, of what a parallel so, polis So, so Chebekah Wagner is out. <laughs> Correct. Hello, maybe uh, my question doesn't uh, really correlate with the uh, theme of the stock, but uh, it's uh, the question that worries me a lot. So uh, in the previous century, in uh, like the same years, uh, many totalitarian regimes uh, started to develop uh, because of the disappointment of uh, the people uh, by previous regimes and also because of uh, technological advances uh, that um, helped uh, govern governments to control uh, people. And uh, honestly, I think the history kind of uh, repeats itself right now because many people uh, are disappointed uh, with uh, the current state of the world all over the world. Uh, and um, 
there are ma many politicians uh, also all over the world in completely different countries that are uh, driven by the beautiful Russian phrase uh, Are we entering the new era of uh, big totalitarian countries all over the, all over the world and uh, are democracies even stand a chance? Um, <clears throat> well, it, that's an easy question to answer because the answer is I don't know, right? I mean, um, it's... We, we only know what we know, which is that things have distinctly gotten worse in the last decade or so. Right? Uh, there's what's, I'm not, I'm, I don't love this term, but it's useful, uh, you know, the, the democratic backsliding um, all over the world. Uh, this idea that we're all, you know, moving toward <clears throat> democracy uh, all over the world has been thoroughly debunked. Um, and, and we're certainly living through another period of um, you know, mass dislocation, mass uncertainty, mass anxiety, which is what brings uh, about these totalitarian regimes, I think. Uh, and I think that's, that's actually a more useful way of thinking about it than you know, technological advances and, um, and people being tired of, of, uh, and disillusioned because I think it's people being anxious and scared um, that, that makes them hand over their agency to somebody who promises them stability and certainty, right? Um, the answer to, to that, but it's also a question, right, is are there other people who are capable of offering uh, a vision of a future, right? The, the sort of the answer to the imaginary past is a glorious future. Uh, is it, you know, and, and it, and I don't have an answer to that question, right? There's, um, uh, you know, if we look at Ukraine, there is certainly, we know, right, we're looking at a nation where there are enough people who share an idea about wanting to live in a certain future together, right? Who want to wake up in the company of their countrymen uh, in a Ukraine of a certain kind, right? There are enough people uh, in that country to have, to have coalesced around this idea to defend their country, um, right? Uh, and but I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of in the Timothy Snyder mo mode of saying let's look at Ukraine and uh, and it's going to save civilization as long as we help it win. Uh, you know, I think actually Ukraine is being degraded by being at war, as any society would be degraded by being at war, and um, and Ukraine is not going to save us. Uh, we're we'll all be very lucky if Ukraine saves itself, right? Um, so. Anyway, that's a long way of saying I don't know. Um, I think. What you want to uh, take one more? No, no. If you if you are not willing to take one more, uh, we can. Do, okay, let's take one more and then. One more. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, dear Masha, dear Andre. Actually, I don't have a question. I want to thank you. I'm from Georgia. I'm from local, so I just wanted to share some of my thoughts as a local, listening to you. Well. Georgia and Russia has a history, as you know. <laughs> Russia invaded Georgia many times, and often when we are meeting with friends in, in Tbilisi, we know there's an argument with the, there's so-called second Russia, right? Or the Russians are the same, and we all, all, only can we expect from them is like a threat and danger, and of course I don't agree with that. And you gave me today, listening to you, both you gave me additional many arguments to go back and talk with my friends, and that there's a second Russia, maybe it's not as big as we want to, but I hope that when you come to power in Russia, your neighbors will be living in a peaceful <laughs> environment, and also Russia will be a peaceful country. And thank you again for coming to Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. A second Russia.